The U.S. Supreme Court ruled this week to strike down a 26-year-old federal law that largely prohibited sports betting in the United States. And that's a ruling means the states are free to legalize betting on sports if they want to. And that could have an effect on Oklahoma, creating business opportunities and new tax revenues. What does all this mean? Here to help us make sense of it is this lady, Jennifer Lamarand, with uh, Crown Dunleavy, Indian Law and Gaming. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And thanks for uh, taking the time and the effort to walk down the street from the law <laughs> offices here to the Oklahoma's Video Studios. I'm happy to be here. Lots of things to chat with this lady about, from uh, Indian law to sports gaming. She also has uh, some of her degrees. She's very well decorated. From London, so we may get into some royal wedding. We never know. Maybe so. Maybe so. First of all, though, uh, sports gaming and what the Supreme Court uh, ruled earlier this week, what might be the impact on Oklahoma? I think it was really interesting to hear the Supreme Court commentary on the dual system of sovereignty. So a lot of the legal issues in the case focused on states' rights. Okay. Um, under the Constitution, you know, states are reserved those rights under the Tenth Amendment to do all those things that are not already given to the federal government. And the case was really about whether the law issue, PAPSPA, uh, was actually commandeering the state legislature and telling them they have to enact this sort of regulation that prohibits sports betting. The Supreme Court said they can't do that. Tenth Amendment bars that sort of activity, so the law is unconstitutional. And a lot of the commentary was, you know, the states have these rights to regulate these types of activities on their own if they choose to do so. So the result is that states are now able to go out and do it. Uh, there is no federal ban on sports betting as there has been for decades. If states that do not already have laws in place to allow sports betting uh, want to move into that type of gaming activity, then they are welcome to start changing their laws to regulate and operate sports betting. And I believe this was a federal law dating back to uh, 1992, so it's been in place for a while. It has. That said, now that this has changed, are we suddenly going to see sports gambling everywhere, or is it going to be a bit of a process? It will be a process, but there are quite a few states that have already started that process. Okay. So there were states that were exempted from PASPA initially, uh, one of those being Nevada. So okay. you've been able for sure. years to go to Nevada. Go to Vegas, and wager on some wager. games. Uh, there are a few other states that were exempted at that time, and there are a few states that in t anticipation of the decision in Murphy have already adopted legislation to legalize sports betting in the state, thinking that the Supreme Court would overturn this law. So there are a few that have already started the regulatory schemes. Those are varying and different in their terms and what they regulate and what kind of fees they impose on sports bets. Um, I think you will not see them everywhere at once. The process, particularly in states with tribal nations, will take some time and it should because the gaming schemes in those states involve tribal nations who are also sovereigns and are major players in this industry. Which brings us to Oklahoma. Oklahoma, you might think, hey, we're further down the road because we do have tribal casinos, but as you mentioned, these are sovereign nations and there are different uh, laws and regulations. I assume you're the expert here. I'll throw that your way. And also let me say, she's a member of the uh, Citizen Potawatomi Nation and Associate Justice on that tribe's Supreme Court lady knows what she's talking about. What might the tribes be thinking and talking about at this point? I imagine that the tribes are talking about how we integrate sports betting within the authorized games that are provided under our Oklahoma Compact. Gotcha. So as many people in the state know, uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act back in 1988 set up a general system about who can operate and regulate different types of games. Uh, some games are left solely to tribes. Some games are allowed to occur if the tribes and the states have compacts, agreements to allow that activity to happen. And that's the case in Oklahoma. Uh, you see many casinos here and they're operating class three games, slot machines, those type of electronic games, table games, uh, through a compact with the state. The terms of that compact you know, dictate what types of games can be offered. Um, and the different fees on them. And I would assume that many of the tribal nations thinking about adopting sports betting now 
are looking at how we just fit sports betting and sports pools into that regulatory scheme that's already in place. Is that doable? How easy is that? How much of a timeline might that be? What's the process there look like? Well, really, it's not an extensive process necessarily okay. as long as we have all of the players on board. So you just saw in this last legislative ses session in the state that we adopted uh, dice and... Uh, ball and dice, right? Ball games, right. So that was an amendment to the statutory definition of covered games and compact. Uh, that is allowed in the terms of the compact. So these are all things that are set forth in this document. This compact document was approved by the uh, people, a vote of the people, back when we adopted Indian Gaming. So these things are all out in the open. They're in the statutes. They're in the compacts. You can see them. And one way that you can uh, adapt, I guess, the types of games offered is to do a statutory amendment, which is what happened with ball and dice games. And in fact, there was an option to go ahead and add sports pools to that amendment. Uh, sports, that didn't, sports pools, what might that right? mean? So, sports betting. Okay. Uh, but that did not go through in this last session. I would imagine that similar legislation will come forward, and perhaps other types of legislation will also come forward, but that would be one way that you could go about just folding in sports betting into the ex existing scheme. Interesting stuff. We're talking with Jennifer uh, Lamarand uh, from Crow and Dunleavy. Uh, she's an Indian law and gaming attorney there. Um, this honestly seems pretty complicated because at the state level, as I understand it, if there are laws and regulations put in, uh, the federal government still then might weigh in again, right? Absolutely. And that was something that is right in the language of the decision. Okay. Um, Justice Alito's decision you know, gave a mandate to states to go out and do as they will with sports betting in the event that Congress does not act. So federal government could act. They could impose some sort of a system, regulatory system on sports betting. Uh, I think it would be somewhat difficult to do that when we already have states moving forward with their own systems in place, but they could still do it. Uh, and the National Indian Gaming Commission has already come out and said that they are happy to be there to assist with any type of regulation on Indian gaming that happens at the federal or the state level. So they are already thinking and planning for whatever might come from either one. I don't think that the federal type of system will come before we get a majority of states that actually move forward. and make sports betting legal. So, so we might see a dozen states on board here from the New Jersey's to whoever uh, and then we might see the government issue some sort of uh, regulation. Is that what I'm hearing? It could happen. In, in really rough words. It could happen. Okay. Uh, I don't, like I said, I don't foresee that being the way that it goes but you never okay. know and it depends on also where the major players in this industry fall and who they just, you know, decide to support and what they decide to push. You might have the sports leagues that are very much in favor of a federal scheme. Uh, there are other types of schemes that are patterns out there. For instance, there's a scheme in Europe that has a broader type of federal regulation uh, in that oversees different states and that could be a model that perhaps the leagues would prefer to implement. Is that something perhaps that uh, is over soccer? The, the soccer leagues there? Right. Okay. Sure. Well, all sporting, yes. Okay, all And sport. soccer being a big one. Mm -hmm. Sure. Interesting. Uh, so a, a league like the NBA might prefer to have one sort of list of regulations that they're playing by versus state by state by state where all their franchises are. Right. They might. And of course, you might have states that, or a lot of it, majority of states, that decide not to even allow sports betting. It's going to be a state by state issue until sure. the federal government acts. So. Perhaps they might see a better result if they got a federal system in place. Um, I think from what we're hearing right now that there's going to be so much state action going for the next year that it's going to be hard to then come in and overlay a federal system, but you never know. Right. Interesting. Um, I guess a state like Utah is probably like, hey, we're not getting involved in this right. just yet. Most other states are probably investigating to various levels, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, Jennifer works at uh, Crow and Dunleavy, right up the street, Indian Law and Gaming. Uh, how did you get into the legal profession? Well, let's see. Going back to undergrad, okay. I was interested in the law. I was 
doing my degree in English literature, so I was reading a lot, writing a lot, and I thought, well, what am I going to do with these skills? And the law presented itself. I had a very good friend that was in accounting at the same school, and she decided to join the pre-law fraternity and asked me to do it with her, and that kind of steamrolled into doing the LSAT and doing the legal prep courses and then eventually getting into law school. So. How did you do on the LSAT? And when you were taking that test, were you like, this, this makes sense to me, my mind works this way? <laughs> well, I did well enough to get into law school, well, so that's a plus. <laughs> yeah. That is great. Um, I always love logic puzzles, so there's okay. a good amount of logic that's involved in the LSAT, writing and logic and reading, and so I thought that it was something that really played to my strengths. and. As I said, I did well enough to get into law school, which is enough. Uh, undergrad at Oklahoma State University, same as our producer Paige. She's probably back in the booth going, go Pokes. Yep. Uh, from there, Notre Dame Law School. Congrats on that. And then Thank London? You. Yes. Yes, absolutely. How was London? It was great. Well, the reason I, I really went to London and did my LLM there is because I view tribal nations as sovereigns. We have so much interaction between different sovereigns in this nation. and. I view that as something similar to what you see in a European system. You have many different states and you have legal actions arising in one state that involve action in another and how do you decide where you bring that legal action if you're challenging it, what law applies, you know, what procedure applies. These are all similar things. In Oklahoma, if you have, for instance, a, a tort claim that happens at a casino, a tribal casino, what law applies to that? Well, many people don't know. There, are actual procedures under the gaming compact that set forth how you go about doing a tort claim. And all of the casinos publicize this. They have their own procedures. They can adopt even further rules and regulations in their own tribal laws to talk about how you do that type of a claim. Uh, but most people don't realize that that's different than state law. Uh, it's state laws don't apply. fascinating for you to, uh, to, aside, to decide and just to be aware of the different layers that take effect. Absolutely. So, as I said, I kind of saw that as similar to an international system, something like you would see in Europe. And I went to do my studying in London to take advantage of all of that information and different perspectives on these systems, and also a lot of different people there who come from different nations sure. that have indigenous people, and how that those systems differ from ours. Ours is really pretty unique. Um, so tell me about what you do right now. We mentioned. Uh, um, your various roles, uh, both in and out of the law firm, but what are the various things you do these days? I'm a litigator, and although I do a lot of Indian law and gaming work, and that involves litigation that uh, has a tribal nation involved or a tribal citizen, I also do other types of litigation, uh, contract litigation, insurance defense, securities litigation, um, all sorts of manner of things that come up at the law firm uh, will be thrown onto my doorstep. And Jennifer, here you it. go. Yes, of course. <laughs> and I'm happy to do it. There are all sorts of different things that arise that involve tribal issues, even estate planning. Sure. A lot of things in Oklahoma, a lot of estate plans in Oklahoma will involve trusts or tribal property, uh, not tribal for the most part, but trust or individual trust property or restricted property. And you have to know how to handle those things in a will or a trust. Different rules apply. Interesting. Interesting conversation in an interesting world, and it'll be interesting to see how the sports uh, betting law changes apply to Oklahoma and other states. Uh, I guess one last question for you. Will you be watching the Royal Wedding on Saturday morning? Absolutely. Yes. Is it 3 a.m. or 4 a.m.? Yeah, it's early enough. I know it's that. early. I want to say that the guests <laughs> perhaps arrive at 5.30ish Oklahoma time, and oh, the goodness. nuptials are at 6. Okay. But, of course, if you're watching all the festivities, you're going to get up earlier than that, right? Yes, and I've already seen people camping out. They're already there along uh, the route to Windsor. So, I don't know uh, the couple times I've been to London that I've been to Windsor. Mm. Um, Fabulous. Kensington, nice. Westminster, Buckingham, but I don't know about Windsor. Uh, Windsor is a lovely place I'm to sure go visit. It is. All of those places are amazing. Uh -huh. uh, one last question for you. What's a good Brit British breakfast? Breakfast for the wedding? To celebrate the wedding? Yeah, if you're watching at home, you're like, hey, uh, I want to get in the spirit here. <laughs> Tea and crumpets or... Well, let's see. I don't know that crumpets would be breakfast. 
but absolutely tea. Okay. And of course, if you're doing a full English breakfast, then it's going to be baked beans and eggs and perhaps some sort of uh, bacon, but thick bacon, uh, tomatoes, mushrooms, all sorts of interesting things. Good stuff. Good conversation with this lady here, Jennifer Lamoran from uh, Crow and Dunleavy. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for the conversation, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll see how things turn out. Thank you for having me.